There have been some really interesting studies done in the last couple of years looking at child um, food product consumption based directly on the efforts of um, food corporations and advertisers to target them. They're having pizza, which at many schools, even at the elementary level, is offered as a daily option. You know, there are many kids um, in our communities who that's the bulk of the food they're getting. Mm. And, and I think that's why we disproportionately see learning problems, mood problems, behavior problems in kids who come from impoverished environments. I guess before we get into the nitty gritty, why don't you share with my audience a little bit about your background? Let's start there. Sure. I've had sort of a winding path with my career. I started out as a teacher, actually. I um, had a degree in special education and thought that teaching and uh, you know being an administrator was going to be my life career. And then I got my first job working with kids with autism and other pretty severe emotional and behavioral challenges and really fell in love with that and quickly realized that what I was doing in the classroom, it was great, but it was like six hours a day. And I had all the parents saying, we need help. We need support. What should I be doing at home? And that really got me interested in delving into more of the family side of it. So I went back to school and got a doctorate in clinical psychology so that I could take families from first noticing that there were issues and problems through the diagnostic process and all the way through really family-based treatment. Um, so that led me to opening my own practice, mainly because I don't do well working for other people. I sort of have ways I wanna do things based on the research and my experience. And so opened my own practice, really specializing in um, holistic family-based treatment for kids, all the way from little, little ones, all the way up through young adults. Um, and then along the way, began to realize that everything that I had learned in my educational background and my clinical psychology training, it was getting good results, but there was a missing piece. I started noticing that lots of the kids coming in had common physiological things in their history, eczema, allergies, um, you know, issues with constipation, with chronic ear infections, things like that. And I went, huh, I wonder what's going on there. Um, and at the same time, had two of my own kids, because by that point I was a parent, um, who were also having some issues. And I was wondering about the connections. And I delved into the research and was really amazed to find this whole realm of scientific literature about the connections between physical health and mental health and brain-based issues for adults and kids that I had never been exposed to or learned about in my traditional clinical psychology training or my education background. And so that got me excited about other things that I could bring to the table for these kids and these families. So I actually went back to school again um, and got a master's in nutrition and integrative health and am board certified in nutrition now because I think that that's such an integral piece to bring to the picture of not only understanding what's at the root of symptoms for a lot of kids, but also what needs to happen from a treatment standpoint to really address um, these things. So yeah, that, that's sort of the journey that I've taken with this. That's amazing. It reminds me of, I was doing a little bit of reading uh, earlier this week about Ansel Keys. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he was a scientist mm -hmm. who became, he developed the key, the K ration. Uh, he was a, a celebrated scientist, but I think, you know, a lot of people have, demonized him over the past couple of, of years because of this, this idea, the narrative that he, you know, he, he created these, uh, these very preliminary, these very early studies that mm -hmm. led to the ultimate demonization of fat, saturated fat, mm -hmm. dietary cholesterol and things like that. But the reason why I bring it up is because, you know, he started to do this research at a time when scientists couldn't fathom that there was a connection between diet and cardiovascular uh -huh. health. Yeah. You know, it was at the birth of nutrition science yeah. that he really got going. And the way that you're talking sounds like you're very much in that camp where it's like mm -hmm. you're making these connections for the first time that actually diet does have an mm -hmm. impact on the health mm -hmm. and the perf and the functioning of the brain. Yeah. Which to me is like you know, gosh, we're going to, over the next, we've already learned so much just over the past couple of years, and we're mm -hmm. only going to learn more in the coming years. So when did you then decide to become a nutritionist? Yeah, it was really around that time when I started looking at, wow, there's research evidence for this. And 
I, I sort of felt like, why is this the first time I'm hearing about this, right? I've been in school forever. I have two master's degrees, a PhD, and I don't know anything about this. And that's really what got me interested in. I, I need to delve into the science here more. I need to understand more of these connections. You know, I'd always felt like... Um, as an adult, I fed myself pretty well, always felt like I was feeding my kids well. Um, and I look back now and I'm like, I would do things so differently based on what I know. But but that's what I knew at the time. And it was probably better than still what what many people feed their kids. But, you know, when you really delve into looking at the food and mood and brain function connection, of course, it makes perfect sense. Right. The brain and the body are totally interconnected. How could it be possible that what we're eating or what we're feeding our kids doesn't have everything to do with their mood, their anxiety, their behavior, their ability to focus? Of course, it inherently makes sense. And yet this is like a fringe position still in some ways, you know, I mean, nutritional psychiatry and nutritional psychology are um, becoming more widely known. There are more professionals interested in looking at that, mainly because the effectiveness of the traditional routes that we've used to treat people with mental health and brain-based issues, not great. And so, you know, there's a lot more people interested in what else can we do, but this is still a pretty revolutionary idea. I mean, if you talk to a lot of even primary care physicians, pediatricians on a basic level, they'll say, yeah, well, you know, food matters, but when a kid comes in with issues, they're not looking at, wow, let's check your vitamin D level or your iron status or Hmm. Let's talk about what's your kid eating, you know, on a daily basis or what are some of the challenges there, you know, digging into some of that. Um, it's just not done routinely. Um, and I hope that that's changing and I hope that that really does become the norm that, you know, I'd love to say 10 years from now, but maybe 20 years from now that this is really the standard of care that things like food, eating habits, uh, lifestyle habits more broadly, sleep, screen time, movement, stress levels, that all of those things are the first things that we're looking at and digging into and talking with families about when kids are struggling. Because the data is there that it makes a really big difference. It's just shifting that to be the focus of practice as opposed to, well, talk to the school about getting some support or go see a counselor mm -hmm. or here's your prescription. Um, and it's not that any of those things are bad. It's just that there's so much more that we can do to get to the root of these things. And I find that really empowering. I find that empowering as a parent of four kids myself. Mm -hmm. And I find it really empowering for all of the families out there um, that are struggling with some of these things, that there are really simple, really effective things that you can do. That's amazing. Well, before we get into, into those, what, so what are some of the, kind of the kinds of problems that you see present, I guess, most frequently in your clinic? Yeah. So my clinic, you know, again, we treat little ones all the way through young adults. So we're seeing anywhere from babies through uh, young adults. That's sort of, you know, it's gotten a little bit older over time. I would say earlier it's like 21. Now we're talking like mid twenties, even up to 30, you know, <laughs> um, at this point. Um, and we see a broad range of things. Some of the most common things are ADHD, depression, anxiety, and just more broadly like behavioral types of disorders. Kids who have what we call dis regulated behaviors. They just seem to not be able to manage themselves well. And then of course we see quite a lot of autism spectrum disorder, um, and then some more, what we would call severe, um, presentations, um, often kids with a very significant trauma history, kids who are maybe born very prematurely. And so have a lot of medical challenges along with brain-based, um, you know, types of things. So, uh, and one of my, specialties at the clinic is really treating kids and young adults who have um, been what we would call treatment resistant, which I hate that term because really it just means that no one's really looked at what's going on. But these are kids who have been placed on all of the different kinds of medications. They've been through the traditional counseling things. They're getting all of those things and they're still not getting better. Um, and those are the cases at this point in my career that are really interesting to me to figure out, hmm, why would this be an issue in a kid? What could be going on? What do we need to look at there? Um, and often it involves uh, getting them um, off of many of the things that maybe they've been put on that are creating additional problems and looking at more holistically how we can address that for them. Mm. Would you say that that rates of these kinds of uh, 
diagnoses are increasing like are we mm-hmm. seeing more adhd now yeah. are we seeing more autism now or are we just getting better at like diagnosing them yeah it's a, it's an important question and the research shows that it's both so certainly awareness especially around autism spectrum disorder that's huge right mm-hmm. when i started my career in the mid 90s um you know it was still one in 200 kids who was diagnosed. And now we're at like one, I think the most recent stats are one in 29 boys. Mm. Um, So there certainly is greater awareness as a piece of it. But we also know that the data shows that really these conditions are on the rise. And, And it is, it's that whole range of what we call neurodevelopmental disorder. So we can throw, you know, ADHD and autism in there, but also things like learning disabilities, um, things like mood dysregulation issues, behavioral, you know, kinds of things. Those are all on the rise. And, you know, that really begs the question, what's going on there that so many more kids, you know, are having these issues, but yeah. So, so it's both pieces. That's so interesting. What, I mean, what would you say is going on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's like, that's like the crux of the, yeah. of the issue, right? Like what's, what's changed in our environment that's causing, mm-hmm. that's causing such a, a stark increase in, in these kinds of conditions. Yeah. And it's not any one thing. It's a lot of things. Um, and so when we look at how not only the environment and the world around us has changed over the last generation, um, but culturally, the pace of life, the things that are available. So the, the research shows several things. One is certainly um, increased toxicity in the environment. Mm. So everything from you know the nutrient density and quality of food um, that kids are eating or not eating um, to things like air quality and pollution, um, you know, all of those things, chemical chemicals that kids are exposed to in utero, um, as well as, you know, during their childhood. So we know those are factors, Um, but there are also factors like um, screen time. The fact that, you know, when I I didn't have my first cell phone, and it certainly wasn't a smartphone, I didn't have a cell phone until adulthood, right? But my kids have grown up with those things around all the time. And so while that's wonderful in many ways, there's also sort of that pendulum swinging of, wow, all of this is there now. And how do we actually regulate and manage that? And we're still trying to figure that out as adults. And then we're supposed to be helping our kids figure that out. Right. Mm -hmm. But there's really compelling data to show that excessive use of screens of technology is a piece of what we're seeing um, on a number of levels with kids. Uh, We also have the most sedentary generation Mm. in history, and that was pre-COVID. And now with COVID, that's only been exacerbated. The data is really not good coming out of that. So we've got sedentary um, kids and people often think about that from the standpoint of physical health, right? Like kids need to move so that they have a healthy weight. Actually, physical movement is critical for brain development and the development of connections in the brain that allow for higher level functions like academic learning, like being able to focus, being able to write your name, all of those things develop um, on a foundation of lots of experience with physical movement and activity in the environment. So when we have babies and toddlers spending a lot of time now, you know, in front of a screen, swiping, you know, a screen or just not out there being as active, it, it has consequences for their brain development and then their later learning and behavior. Um, so we know that there's all of these pieces. There's sleep, you know, sleep quality has diminished. There's the busyness of families. Mm. It's one of the biggest things that we see is um, families are so busy. I think COVID again has helped with that. I'm hoping that many families really analyze what does going quote unquote back to normal need to look like? Because for a lot of them, maybe what was normal in terms of the pace of life really wasn't good for them or their kids. So we've got really high stress levels um, in families, lots of um, sort of chaoticness and activities, we know that has a negative impact too. So it, I don't think um, it's any one thing. I think it's really a perfect storm of lots and lots of things that are coming together to create issues for our kids. The technology piece is terrifying because, yeah. you know, when you t- look at your average adult these days, right. they're addicted to their smartphones. Totally. And then you, you give such an addictive device. I was going to call it a substance. You yeah. know, when you give it a, yeah. like we don't allow 
our children to have access to addictive substances. Right. And yet we don't bat an eye when mm -hmm. we give them these devices yep. that are meant to, you know, chronically elicit these like dopamine spikes on a regular mm -hmm. basis and their brains are not yet developed. Mm -hmm. so. Right. We have no data. It's, it's an entire generation of guinea pigs about what the longer term repercussions of this are going to be. We know in the short term, um, the data shows that used at an appropriate level, which appropriate, there's sort of a wide range in the studies that have been done, but you know, it's not all detrimental. And it's important that kids learn how to have a healthy relationship with technology because it is here to stay. It, it provides so many great benefits and it's going to be a part of their lives forever. But it's that finding that middle ground of how do we use it instead of letting it use us? Mm -hmm. And what does that mean long term? What does that look like for kids who maybe had excessive exposure from a very early age? What does that look like at 10, at 20, at 40? Um, the data so far is concerning. It's not conclusive, but it's concerning. And, you know, one of the biggest issues with that is this idea called displacement, that it's not necessarily the actual exposure to the devices themselves that's the issue. It's that it displaces all the other important things that kids should be doing to support their development, mm. that it takes the place of them getting outside and running around and climbing trees and riding their bikes and, you know, running through the neighborhood with their friends. It takes the place of them um, having real conversations with people or them doing pretend play on their own or them even just being bored hmm. and not having anything to do, which developmentally is a really important thing for kids to be bored. We know that. And kids are rarely bored anymore. And wow. that's problematic. So it's that idea that the devices themselves aren't bad. And there's some question as to whether even the exposure is a problem, although we know it is for eye health and vision and those kinds of things. Um, but it's this displacement. It's that kids are now spending a good portion of their waking hours doing those kinds of things on a screen as opposed to all of the other really important physical and brain-based things that they need to be doing. I mean, when I was a kid, I remember being addicted to, maybe not, I wasn't, I actually wasn't, I wouldn't say that I was addicted, but I definitely enjoy playing video games. Sure. But, but when I was a kid, those video games were attached to my television. Yes. So when I was yep. in school, when I was going to and from school, when I was sitting in my mm -hmm. dad's car, when I was, you know, on the bus going to school, I was, you know, my yep. mind had the ability to wander. That's right. Which I guess for kids these days, they've got these devices in their pockets all the time. Yeah. It, and that's one of the things. And so often parents will say, well, they're bored. They need something to do. And helping parents to understand that not only is it OK for your child to be bored, they actually need to have the experience of being bored, mm. of not having um, externally driven activities and stimulation, of, of having to self-generate ideas come up with things and you know what if they don't that's okay just the experience of being in a room or wandering around outside and actually taking in everything around you what a profoundly simple but important thing and for a lot of kids that is not a part of their experience and when you get used to you know you said the dopamine piece when you get used to that constant that next hit of external stimulation you lose or perhaps don't develop even in the first place, depending on the age of the child, the ability to create that for yourself, the ability to self-generate interesting things, to take action on experiences, on the environment in ways that you can learn from because you're just waiting passively for the next piece of stimulation to hit you. So I get that it's a challenge sometimes for parents because they say, oh, you know, I need my child to be in front of the iPad. And I say, okay, but let's figure out how to find a balance there. And, and also, and this is sort of like, I, I'm, I just am a pretty straight shooter with parents. Um, just as a parent myself, I can get away with doing that, right? I have four kids, so I sort of have some lived experience with that. It's like, okay, I get it. It's easier to have the device babysit a kid, especially over the last year. Like I get it, but also we need to look at that as part of our responsibility as a parent and say, if we know that something is inherently not 
real good for them and we know there's some other things that they should be doing, then then we need to take a look at that. And we need to say, you know, as you said, just like we wouldn't give them access to things that we know are really unsafe or, you know, addictive, we need to look at, you know, some of these things. And, and electronics are definitely one of them. And, you know, you said the addictive substance is the other addictive substance that we absolutely let kids just have <laughs> constantly is sugar. Sugar and devices are the two, like two of the biggest addictive substances that we know impact people, not just kids, but people in general. And we've got a whole lot of kids running around with a whole lot of sugar addiction and a whole lot of device, um, if not addiction, a whole lot of use of those. And, you know, if we would address just those two things alone, we'd probably be doing, you know, a lot better than we are. Yeah. When I was a, when I was a kid, I was bored one time and I turned, bo- I turned a box into yep. a costume Yes. and I turned myself into a robot. I yep. would like get actually inside the box mm-hmm. and I put little holes where yeah. like I would tell, I told my mom to like put in little, like little paper inputs and I would spit something out. And I was like, yeah. I became a robot when I was in That's that right. box. Yeah. But I feel like these days, if I had access to, I don't know, like an iPad or mm-hmm. something, I mean, I guess there, there are probably games that allow children to be creative, but within the constraints of the game yeah. or the program, That's right. you know, whereas yeah. without that, you can kind mm-hmm. of, the world becomes your, mm-hmm. your, you know, your oyster. That's exactly right. I mean, we literally, we have kids who come into the clinic who don't know how to play. Wow. Who, when we just put them in a room with lots of things, not um, electronics kind of toys where you hit buttons and things, but things like blocks, things like puppets, things like empty boxes and craft materials and just observe what they do with them. There are many kids that really struggle in the absence of some sort of outside Um, you know, direction of what they should do, or they go, this is so boring. You know, I hate this. Um, And I go, oh yeah, you know, it probably is. And and for a lot of them, then if you leave them in there, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, suddenly it's opened up this whole world of things. Like they've made a robot costume out of a box and they didn't know (laughs) that they could do that, but it's those experiences. And and I think that so often um, parents are so busy. They don't just stop and reflect on what is my child maybe missing out on there or, or how could we embed more of that one day leads to the next leads to the next everybody's just trying to get by and suddenly you realize oh my gosh like my kid you know the iPad broke and now I'm face to face with that my kid doesn't know what to do with themselves mm-hmm. and you know how how can we shift things so yeah. You mentioned uh, sugar. I want to yeah. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk yeah. about nutrition because that's yeah. one of your areas of focus. Yeah. Um, sugar. There's a lot of misconceptions. I, there are a lot of sort of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. People will, you know, on the Internet say that sugar is the worst thing in the yeah. world. And then there are people who now are coming out and are sort of almost acting like apologists for sugar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, which I, I've seen quite a bit in the fitness yeah. community, right. but I'm sure exists yeah, yeah. in other in other realms. Mm-hmm. So talk to me a little bit about about sugar. Yeah, it's it's one of the biggest levers that I think, based on the research, we can pull when it comes to wanting to support kids physical and mental health, because um, and sugar sugar's not bad, just like electronic devices aren't bad, right? I, th- I think we've we've lost this ability, um, whether it's about these topics or virtually anything else at this <laughs> point, at least in the United States, to have any sort of healthy way of looking at a middle ground yeah. with things. The ability to have nuanced thoughts. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, say, well, probably really almost nothing is all good or all bad. There's probably a middle ground there and maybe I can understand more about that. So these things fall in that middle ground, right? I think it's a terrible idea to say all sugar is bad. Kids should never have it. Well, I mean, first of all, we know that that sets kids up for eating disorders for lots of problematic things when we, you know, just come in and full swoop, take everything out of, you know, their diet, don't allow them any access. They don't know how to regulate themselves around it. Right. I want to talk a little bit about this. Um, how do we, so you mentioned eating disorders. I grew up in a house where, um, we had sugary foods. Mm -hmm. We had, I had John, I had gushers and Dunkaroos and Frosted flakes and pop tarts <laughs> and all and you know Entenmann's donuts mm-hmm. and all sorts of crap yeah. that you know that that I enjoyed to eat. But my mother did a really good job, I thought, of telling me that these foods are not really good for you. Mm-hmm. 
to not eat them often, mm-hmm. you know, to kind of like limit your consumption of them. Um, but we still had them. And I grew up with, I think, a healthy, I could mm-hmm. be wrong, but I think I have a healthy relationship with food. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I have a healthy relationship with food. And I, I'm able to acknowledge that these food, that certain foods are not good for me. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, so how do we basically send this message, message to our children? Yeah, I mean, it's tricky. There's so many things that go into why um, some kids develop disordered eating patterns. Um, and some of it has to do with how food is approached and what's available. Some of it has to do with traumas, with you know anxiety. There's all kinds of issues. But basically, if we want kids to grow up with a healthy, balanced way of understanding food, we have to be teaching them that um, from an early age, just talking about food in healthy, appropriate ways like, oh, you know, look at these these veggies. Like, let's take a look at these. Oh, these are all different colors. You know, what's so cool about that is each of the different colors has these amazing things that help our brain and body function better. And so when we eat a yellow pepper, we get the yellow nutrients that are good for us. And so even from a very young age, talking about that, oh, we're going to have fish. Fish is so good for our brain. Oh, you want to, you know, be able to really think well and do this stuff. Oh, fish is where it's at, right? And then as kids get into the elementary years and certainly into the teen years, having more sophisticated conversations with them around that, even about the the choices that we're making. You know, I'm a big one for parents to talk about their own successes and failures. Like, you know, oh man, you know, those donuts looked so good today at work and man, I had two of them because they just were so good. And now, you know, I wasn't able to get my work done well this afternoon. Like my brain's just not really turned on well. And I'm kind of just feeling like my stomach doesn't feel good. I really wish I would not have eaten two of those. Right. Mm. That's not giving a lecture. That's not telling a kid, you better not ever eat donuts. That's saying, let me just share with you what's happening with me. It's a way to give them insight into the understanding of how the things that we put in our mouth impact the way that we feel and helping them from a young age be able to identify that for themselves and not having a situation where nothing is around. Because I feel like there's two main groups of people that I see in the clinic or even that I I speak to, you know, in my online stuff, people who have no understanding of this. And so everything is in their house and it's a free for all, like everybody (laughs) just eats whatever they want all the time. Or people who have ventured into sort of this health and wellness or nutrition world online or elsewhere and are like, you know, we only have, you know, unprocessed whole foods. We only have, and I'm like, okay, but that's not the world your child is going to exist in. And it's actually not the world they exist in now. Hmm. When they go to school, they are surrounded by kids eating that. They're having birthday parties in the classroom. They're going to soccer practice. So how do we familiarize them with that? How do we expose them? How do we help them figure out how to make the best decisions for them, for how their body works, for how their brain works. And an all or nothing approach is not the way to do that. Yeah, I agree. So should parents then, you know, have these foods in the house and then to just offer a gentle sort of explanation, of course, not, not fear, ba- a fear based one, yeah. but like, you know, this is good you can eat this and enjoy this on occasion Mm -hmm. you know keep keep them around but maybe like on a high shelf or something so they're not always at eye level like they are in supermarkets that's right which junk food manufacturers love to put you know they put they they make their they they advertise their products with like primary colors they're Mm -hmm. always at eye level for children it's insane well the marketing with kids like there have been some really interesting studies done in the last couple of years looking at child um food product consumption based directly on the efforts of um, food corporations and advertisers to target them. Um, And, you know, even there was an interesting one done online recently where um, kid YouTube influencers are now getting huge contracts from food companies to have their products out because that is so compelling to children. Used to be on TV, right? You and I were exposed to ads for things on TV and it'd be like, oh, mom, you know, get this for us, get this for us. And the research shows that when kids ask for things, parents tend to get it. Now kids aren't watching TV as much, but they are watching YouTube. They're using apps. And so the advertisers have gotten wise to that. So so that's a big piece of it. But again, they're going to be exposed to it. So as parents, it's our responsibility to help them interpret that. Oh, yeah, you saw that. Huh? Well, what do you think about that? Hey, let me show you something. Do you see like, let's go to the store and check that out. That thing that you want to get. 
Cool. Let's go look at it. All right. Let's look at how many grams of sugar it has. Wow. That's got twice the grams of sugar that a kid your age should be having in a day. Hmm, What do you think about that? Like, would you want to have one of these? And that would be all your sugar for the day. Like, what do you think about a food that has that much? Let's look at what some other options are. Let's compare, right? You turn that into a learning opportunity for them because I'm a big believer in avoiding language of good and bad Hmm. around food for kids, even for kids with frank allergies. We don't want to talk about things as good or bad. We want to talk about how does our body respond to those things? How do I feel and function? when I'm consuming that food. Um, So yeah, we should have things around, but we should have boundaries around it, just like we do or we should for all other things for our kids, right? Whether it's, you know, foods or electronics or, you know, whatever it might be, um, we should have some boundaries around that. And parents ultimately are in charge of what their kids are eating, right? So a kid might see the donuts in the cupboard and want those for every meal and snack. And it's up to us to say, "Mm, nope, you know, let's think about that because you already had one of those earlier. So great. And here's what I'm serving for lunch. And this is what we're having. And, you know, it doesn't involve donuts or you can have a donut again tomorrow or whatever, whatever languaging or whatever boundaries you want to put on that. But to help them think about, again, it's that goal of helping them to learn how to regulate themselves around this stuff and how to develop a healthy relationship with these things. Because if we just say no all the time, they are going to grow up to be teenagers who, when they're at other people's houses, go nuts with that stuff because they don't know how to think about it and how to regulate it. As an adult, they'll probably really struggle. There's a lot of backlash with that. So, you know, short of there being some kind of really, um, you know, life-threatening allergy or um, really a significant food sensitivity where it's like, no, we cannot have that in the house. There are valid reasons to keep certain things out of the house. But even when I work with kids who have pretty restrictive diets for medical or mental health reasons, there's still a lot of leeway that we can find in that. And, you know, even a kid who needs to be on a gluten, dairy, soy, and egg-free diet, we better still be finding some recipes to help that parent be able to make or to purchase some cookies, some things like that, because that's just normal and appropriate and healthy. And kids need to have those experiences with those kinds of foods. Do you think it's, is it getting more difficult for parents? Mm -hmm. In general, across the board, do I think it's more difficult to parent today than it probably was in previous generations? Yeah, I do. Because parenting, it doesn't like, you know, having a child, having a baby, it's not like you go to the hospital and they give you like an instruction manual. (laughs) That's right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And and I feel like it's just getting more difficult. Mm -hmm. Like there are all these like caveats. And is it is it a response to, you know, just going back to the environment? Is it a response? Mm -hmm. Is it becoming more difficult because... There's food, you're, you're, you're having, you're having to act as a counterbalance to mm-hmm. the food marketers and the yes. technology and all that stuff. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, um, I'm one of four kids. So my, my parents raised four kids and my mom has said before, she's like, man, she's like, I think it's a lot. You guys have it a lot harder today. I mean, with, you know, they didn't have to deal with tech. They didn't, it, it wasn't around, you know, my elementary school got their first computer when I was in fifth grade and we like got to use it for 10 minutes, maybe once a month, right? Mm. These things weren't around. It wasn't, it wasn't a thing. Um, Food was different, right? There wasn't nearly the amount of fast food, processed food, that kind of stuff. So in those ways, yeah, it's gotten more challenging. The world, um, Technology is amazing, but it's made the world a more complicated place in a lot of ways, right? We move infinitely faster. Um, there's just so much more available. And so I think it's harder for parents to stay on top of all that. And everybody's busier. You know, the sort of um, you can have it all movement, which I think is awesome. I mean, as a as a career-driven working mom myself, I get that. And I also very, very clearly understand the limitations of that too, right? You actually can't have it all in all areas, right? There's things that have to give and I have to prioritize giving in some areas over here in order to be able to prioritize some things with my kids over here. And I think that balance sometimes is tricky, um, is tricky for people. Yeah. We talked about sugar a little Mm -hmm. bit and how minimizing it uh, is probably a smart idea. Yeah. What about fats and the fat composition of mm-hmm. of your child's diet? Yeah, I think again, 
this, this is a thing that, um, has grown out of sort of the broader debate and or debacle, we could probably call it around fat, right? Mm -hmm. So really most people's prevailing idea is fat is bad, low fat is good, fat is bad. And particularly where we need to do a lot of education with people around that is in the realm of brain health and function because the brain is made heavily of fats. And when we have kids who aren't getting enough of the right fats um, and are getting too many of those inflammatory, not great fats, we know that leads to problems. We have studies linking things like lower levels of omega-3 fatty acids and high levels of omega-6s to everything from ADHD to um, you know depression. Certainly that's a big area of research for that um, to other kinds of mood issues. So we know that that that's important. Um, and the problem is that a lot of almost all of the quote unquote kid friendly foods um, don't have good healthy fats in them. Mm. They've got a lot of pro inflammatory omega sixes, things like packaged chicken nuggets, pizzas, hot dogs, you know, all of that kind of stuff, but they are lacking in the good brain quality kind of fats that we need, like from fish and other kinds of um, seafood and even plants. Um, so that's an area that I think is low hanging fruit when a kid is struggling, especially to look at not only how we can start to shift the diet, but also supplementation is so effective there. Mm -hmm. And the data is really good on that too, of, you know, using supplements with good quality omega-3 fatty acids, um, depending on the issues, looking at what the ratio needs to be between DHA and EPA. But we know that there's really important benefits. And even for people who say, well, not everybody, not every kid with ADHD HD is going to have their symptoms go away just from taking fish oil. That's absolutely true. But what we know is even for kids who benefit from stimulant medications, for example, we have studies showing that the benefits from those medications increase when we make sure that they're taking a supplement or eating a diet that has the right balance of uh, omega, uh, particularly the omega threes. So why wouldn't we do that? Right. Why wouldn't we prescribe alongside of a stimulant medication for a child who may really benefit from that? Also a nutrition protocol that is not only going to support their brain and their body, but help their medication work better. To me, that just makes sense. Absolutely. I'm scared to know if, if you actually have this statistic, but you know, your average adult today consumes 60% of the calories. Mm -hmm. I believe it's 58% of the calories that your average American adults, that your average American adult consumes comes, come from ultra processed foods. Yeah. I bet you it's way higher than that it's for, very, for kids. It's very high. And I, I would have to look up what the exact current stat is, but it's very high. Wow. A, a large preponderance of the food that kids are eating. And, and if you think about it, particularly in the United States, in our culture, we, we were the ones that created the kids menu, <laughs> right? At restaurants, which is like just a bizarre thing, right? Like at what point did we decide kids shouldn't be eating the rest of the things that the, you know, the things that we're eating? No, what we do now, not only in restaurants, but in the grocery store, on the advertising, all of that, there's these kid-friendly foods, you know, mac and cheese and hot dogs and pizza and the dinosaur chicken nuggets and, oh yeah, fruit um, in a cup form, uh, tube yogurts with a whole bunch of high fructose corn syrup, artificial dyes, chemicals, all those things. So even a lot of what's marketed as healthy um, for kids is ultra processed, which we know does not do good things for their brain and their body. It does not set them up for a lifetime of wellness, um, mental health or physical health. Um, and it just doesn't give them the fuel that they need. And so parents are like, my kid doesn't sleep well. My kid has post-nasal drip all the time. My kid's constipated all the time. My kid is so anxious. They won't go to friends' houses. My kid is bouncing around the classroom and won't focus, you know, all of these things. And it's like, okay, Let's look at all of the pieces there because there can be many pieces playing into that. Food's absolutely one of them. I don't know a kid alive who, if you feed them on what sort of are the popular things that kids want to eat, are going to function real well. Hmm. That's just not how the human brain and body works, especially not for young kids 
who are still in the process of developing the parts of the brain that are able to do things like regulate their emotions, regulate their behaviors, you know, manage all of that. So they don't have all of those things operational yet. And we're not giving them the building blocks they need to develop those connections. And then we throw our hands up and we're so frustrated, you know, that they aren't managing themselves well or that they're struggling in school or having all of these kinds of issues. Um, So I'm not saying nutrition is the only thing that needs to happen, but the fact that we so rarely look at it and it plays such a critical role to me is just such a missed opportunity. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I, there were probably stretches of days that went by as a kid where the first thing that I ate for breakfast, bowl of cornflakes, uh, with probably some low fat or, you know, some milk variant. Mm -hmm. Um, then I went to school and I had a school lunch in New York. We had pretty decent school lunches, but even decent, uh, it's all shelf stable food. You know, they, these like, uh, lunch, uh, what are they called? Chef, not chefs. Lunch like the cafeteria. That's women right. Yeah. Or right. Right. Keep, yeah. Just like open, pop open a can. Yeah. Reheat the That's right. whatever it was, and then I'd go home. Maybe I'd have a piece of whole fruit, which would probably be the healthiest thing that I eat over the course of the day. And then at dinner, I would have like pasta, like noodles with mm-hmm. with butter, which at the time wasn't even real butter, but mm-hmm. margarine. Margarine. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, and, you know, it's interesting as we think about school food or even a lot of the food programs for kids with food insecurity, because that's a huge issue. But there are some great model programs doing that beautifully. We can so improve the quality of food that we're giving to kids, not only through our school food programs, but through programs in the community. And and there are models showing us how, even with the dollars that schools are given, how you can do that in a very palatable, kid-friendly, whole foods way. And, you know, I think that's a great example. I get called in to do consultations in schools. Sometimes it's for one kid. Sometimes it's for like just the kids in general. And when you arrive in the morning and you start observing, you see this really interesting pattern, right? Like the kids come in and what are they being served for breakfast? Strawberry or chocolate flavored Cow's milk, right? Which actually a carton of that has more grams of sugar in it than the same size can of Coke or soda pop. Oh my God. But it's milk, so it's healthy. So drink up, right? (laughs) Um, And then they're having, you know, their waffles with syrup sponsored by, you know, I don't know if we can say brands on here, but, you know, sponsored by the popular brands that (laughs) make these packaged things, right? And so they're eating pastries and donuts and, and sugary cereals, but it's still technically meets the requirements for the federal food program. But what we're doing there is just giving kids this rush of sugar first thing in the morning. Ooh, now they're really ready for learning, right? So they've had all this, they head into the classroom and what happens? They start on this blood sugar roller coaster throughout the day, right? They've had all of these simple carbs and sugars, blood sugar goes up. Now they're inattentive. They're having trouble, you know, sitting still. There's all kinds of issues, right? And we've taken away a lot of the opportunity for them to go out on the playground even and burn those off. You know, a lot of schools have gotten rid of a lot of the recess things Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So, okay, blood sugar peaks, then it crashes. Now they're grumpy, irritable, foggy, you know, sitting with their head down on the desk, but then lunch rolls around. They come back to the cafeteria. Well, now they're having their food program sanctioned, you know, French fries, which kept with ketchup, which counts says two servings of um, fruits and vegetables. That's exactly right. (laughs) They're having pizza, which at many schools, even at the elementary level, is offered as a daily option Hmm. um, where if you don't want what else is served, we'll always have this for you or a PB&J on white bread, again, with the flavored milks. Um, You know, the salads consist of iceberg lettuce with some shredded, um, you know, cheddar cheese and then whatever's in the ranch dressing. And so we start that all over again. Right. And you know, there are many kids um, in our communities who that's the bulk of the food they're getting. Hmm. And and I think that's why we disproportionately see learning problems, mood problems, behavior problems in kids who come from impoverished environments. Yes, there are certainly issues of, you know, what's going on at home and all of those kinds of things. But but a piece of it is they are getting the majority of their food and nutrition from these 
federal or state kinds of programs. And we can be doing a much better job to feed these kids, all, all of the kids. Yeah. Let's tackle breakfast. So you're a busy mm, mom. Yeah. You obviously you do so many things. You've got an online presence. You're an author. Yeah. You've got a clinic to run and you've got four kids. So for busy moms or dads that yeah. are listening, what's like a go to what are what are some of your staple breakfasts? Right. Because yeah. I think one of the reasons why cereal Mm -hmm. has become so popular is because it makes it just so easy yeah. for working parents, right? Yeah. But what are some 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 healthy alternatives? Yeah, and I'm not actually against cereal. I think there are some decent cereals. Hmm. Um, I think what we want to be focused on, especially for kids, especially if they're having some challenges, if they're having some attention or learning issues, some behavioral challenges, um, we want to be thinking protein first thing in the morning, right? Ideally protein and healthy fat, but I really just have people think about protein. So if you are going to have that bowl of cereal, let's look at how to do one that has whole grains, that doesn't have a lot of added sugars. And what can we pair that with? Can we do, um, you know, maybe they'll eat some yogurt with, you know, some fruit in it. Yogurt, meaning um, a full fat yogurt that doesn't have added sugars, not a, not one of these swirly colored, you know, that's not yogurt, that's sugar basically mm. in, a, in a cup. So if they can tolerate dairy, maybe they'll do that. Or maybe we can um, heat up uh, a sausage or two to go with that bowl of cereal. Or maybe it's a kid who will eat some eggs. Um, and a lot of these things can be done ahead of time. Like even um, I'll do like uh, I have a recipe for protein balls on my website. Easy to mix up. Kids can help with that. They're tasty and they get a good balance of proteins, of healthy fats, of carbs, because especially for kids, carbs are important. I feel like this message gets lost too, especially in the realm of like more extreme diets now for adults. I'll have Families come in and they'll be like, we're all keto. And I'm like, well, there's the problem. Because while that may be just fine for you, growing kids need carbs. So you, in your well-intentionedness, giving them you know, lots of meats and lots of proteins and fats, um, you're missing out on something really important because kids absolutely do need enough of the right kinds of carbs. So it's really about that balance. And I'm all about things that we can prep early in the week, you know, even on Sunday, have in the fridge for kids to grab. Um, I am all about do what is manageable. If you can find, you know, a protein shake or smoothie um, that's pretty decent that your 13 year old is willing to, you know, grab on their way to the bus stop in the morning, fine. Maybe it's a protein bar. Um, maybe it is some other packaged thing that meets more of the requirements of gives them a good boost of protein, doesn't have a ton of sugar and chemicals in it. Great. Doesn't have to be complicated. And maybe you are a family who, you know, one or both of you as the parents is waking up in the morning and making a breakfast of, you know, eggs and whatever for yourself. And you can make some for the kids. That's great too. There's not any one way this needs to be done. And I think that's a really important message with nutrition. And it's one of the things, Max, actually, that I appreciate about sort of your message, you talk about like, this doesn't have to be complicated and we don't have to like make everything super fancy or expensive. This can be easy. Let's make it easy. Let's look at some simple things that we can do, getting the amount of sugars down, looking at nutrient density, trying to get some quality proteins and fats. And let's do that in a way that is manageable and that doesn't stress everybody out so that they go, oh, we can't even do this. Like I did this for a day and now I can't do it. Um, and I think unfortunately, a lot of the messaging that that is out there, even a lot of um, well-intentioned professionals who are putting together plans for kids and families. I mean, I see some of them that come into my clinic and I'm like, I couldn't do that. <laughs> and I have degrees in this and I've been, you know, um, managing special diets and nutrient dense food for my family for a long time. Some of these programs and plans are so complicated that's not helpful either, because now what we've done is said, OK, we're going to get really good nutrient dense food in you and also massively increase the stress level in your home <laughs> so that everybody's actually worse off than they were before they started eating a nutrient dense diet. So I'm just all about making it practical and reasonable for people, because otherwise they're not going to do it. Yeah, I love that. I love that you recommended protein shakes for kids, because yeah. I think a lot of people think about protein shakes, uh, you know, as being something exclusive to bodybuilders. Yeah. But that's a great, I wish I had protein shakes when I was a kid. They're so, some of them are so tasty. They're like yep. milkshakes. They are and they're easy and they're quick. You can mix them up ahead of time. And one of my, you know, big things is let's get kids in the kitchen. 
Um, we know the research clearly shows that kids who are exposed to food and cooking and grow up even with some basic skills, they eat better when they get to adulthood. All of their factors taken out, just knowing some basics in cooking, in the realm of cooking, allows them to consume a better diet. So it's a really fundamental thing we can be doing. And things like protein shakes are a great start. Teach them how to use the blender. Like, let's mix these up. What do you want here? They get to have choices, right? Okay, we can pick the flavor of the protein powder. Let's, what are our add-ons? We want to throw some fruits in here. Which ones do you want? What did you like last week? Let's experiment. And usually families then hone in on a couple of sort of recipes or combinations that go down really easily for their kids. And then that's a great go-to. And, and for kids who don't want to drink that stuff, you know, you rarely meet a kid who doesn't want an ice cream bar or a popsicle. Well, you know what you can do with that protein smoothie is throw it in some popsicle molds and guess what? Your four-year-old will love that popsicle or that ice cream bar that he or she gets to have for breakfast the next morning. And you know, oh, it's just the protein shake, but look, it's in a fun shape with a stick on the end and everybody's happy. Are you kidding? I'm going to go downstairs and make the, I'm going to literally run to the store and get popsicle yes, molds because that sounds amazing. Yes. It can be fun. It can be easy. And here's the thing. We we project our own adult issues around healthy eating onto kids. Kids are like blank slates for the most part. I mean, yes, we do have a very small subsection of children that really do have feeding disorders, extreme picky eating, those types of things. But when we're talking about the general population of kids, most of their ideas around food come from what's projected on them from messaging in adults around them. And we put a lot of our messaging around that. You know, they hear dad say, oh, you know, I never ate broccoli as a kid or, you know, I hate broccoli. As the parents say, how can I get my kid to eat better? I'm like, tell me what you're eating because that's a huge thing, right? Kids, that the modeling is critical. You can't say to your four-year-old or your 14-year-old, you need to be drinking more water throughout the day when they never see you drinking water during the day, Yeah, right? You can't. So that modeling and that engaging them in the process of that, like it's just huge. One yeah. in 10 adults don't drink any water. It blows yeah. my mind. Absolutely. I'm surprised it it's not actually more suck. than one in 10, actually. Yeah. I believe yeah. that was the last I checked. Yeah, yeah. that's it. It's insane. Is, uh, is Stevia a Dr. Birkin's approved um, non-caloric sweetener? You know what? It is because again, I, with, with a few exceptions, I'm not about taking anything away totally. Now, artificial sweeteners like aspartame, sucralose, you know, acesulfame, potassium, those I am very, I don't think those have um, a place in people's diets, particularly not kids based on the data and what we know about that. Um, but stevia, you know, I mean, there's pros and cons to it. Would I much rather a child have, you know, a, a food that is sweetened with that than high fructose corn syrup? Absolutely, I would. Hmm. And I don't care whether it's chemically made or grown in the earth or whatever. I mean, I think there's these ideas of things that are better or worse as opposed to things that are definitively good or bad. Hmm. And so, you know, if we say to families, don't do high fructose corn syrup because that's really terrible, but also don't do any of the artificial sweeteners um, and, you know, limit the amount of sugar. We're not leaving, you know, and, th and then if we say also none of the plant based Sweeteners are okay either. I mean, we're we're leaving moms and dads wandering around glassy eyed in the grocery store looking at labels going, I can't find anything that fits this criteria. Um, but again, I think that goes back to those kinds of foods sweetened with those things would be ideally part of mm -hmm. a diet that includes lots of other things too. Yeah. So it's not that um, that stevia would be integrated to the complete and total exclusion of no. of sugar. No. But it's just good to have that as an option to just yeah. cut down on the overall sugar burden, perhaps. That's right. And and because it's complicated. When families, you know, try to read labels on things, food manufacturers, it's gotten really complicated, right? I mean, to, to figure out what does it mean natural? What does it mean? I mean, it means whatever they want it to mean. And yeah. it's confusing and it's hard. And, and I get it. I have a lot of empathy and understanding of um, parents who are walking through the grocery store on a busy day trying to fill their cart with things that are going to be healthy for themselves and for their kids, but also having all of the, you know, the last three blog posts and podcasts and whatever else rattling around in their head and being so confused about 
is this good? Is this not good? Oh my gosh, this has, you know, this in it. I just, and then what happens is we get so overwhelmed, we shut down to the whole thing Hmm. and go, screw it. I'm going back to just the way, you know, that we were eating and whatever, this is too much. I'm anxious about it. I don't know. You know, none of it is making any sense. And so I just think we have to try to keep it practical and reduce, reduce the overwhelm for people. Yeah. I brought up stevia because you had mentioned Greek yogurt. Yeah. Uh, but plain, you know, not not Correct. with a ton of added sugar. Yeah. And so I thought it would be at least useful to some people in the audience. You know, I, I buy um, this like fat free Greek yogurt, which is mm-hmm. a very amazing protein yeah. source. It's got like Absolutely. 80 calories yes. per cup and yeah. 18 grams of protein. Yeah. It's like, where else can you find that? Uh-huh. Something with, with those kinds of macros. Yeah. And so I buy it plain, but I'll put I always keep in my house um, a variety of different flavored stevia drops. Mm-hmm. And so I'll just put some of those in yeah. the yogurt and mix it up yep. and it's totally sweet. It feels like a treat, but it's so good for you. Absolutely. And then you can also use that. Another, another cool hack, both for yourself and for your kids. I buy, I'll buy unflavored uh, club soda mm-hmm. and you can put those same drops yeah. into your unflavored club soda. And suddenly you have like a delicious stevia mm-hmm. sweetened yep. soda. Absolutely. And those are like sparkling water um, is such a great option. We're talking about hydration, you know, and how many adults are not well hydrated. Um, the data is there for kids too. And we know there have been studies done on academic performance for kids with even mild dehydration, which let's face it, most kids are walking around at least mildly dehydrated. Even mild levels of dehydration negatively impact um, their attention, their work completion, and you know their grades. So that's low-hanging fruit too of saying, how can we just better hydrate kids? How can we make water interesting? Let's get club soda, sparkling water. Let's look at freezing whatever fruits they like. And kids love to do this too. Get the ice um, cube molds and let them make their own fruity ice cubes. And they put those in their water bottle, add some stevia drops, you know, to sparkling water, or there's other um, options out there now that, um, you know, just have flavors without chemicals and things in it. Look at how you can make this interesting. Um, get crazy straws. You, you will not believe the number of kids who are like, I'm not going to drink water. And then I'm like, but pick a straw. And I've got like six really cool looking straws. And they're like that one. And yes, I will drink it. Right. Get them a cool water bottle. Let them have choices. Let them decorate their water bottle. Like make it interesting. Make it kid friendly and get them hydrated. And, you know, the more that we push in things like water things like produce, things like, you know, a a protein shake, popsicle, um, those kinds of things, the less room there is for all the other stuff that we don't want them having. And so that's also why I'm a big proponent of what can we put in? What can we focus on adding as opposed to just this focus on what we're taking away or what you can't have? I love that. Let's uh, shift gears yet again and talk a little bit about exercise because we Mm. don't have that much time left. But, um, but exercise, yeah. What is your what is your recommendation for parents out there with kids that are just plugged into their devices? How do you get kids moving more? Yeah, so exercise can be such a um, dirty word for so many people. Again, adults have su- such like ideas about exercise. So I just like to call it movement. Like we're just going to move our body. Let's focus on movement. Um, And so that's how I talk about it with kids and families. And I have them actually look at how much movement is incorporated in your day. Some kids are getting a lot of movement. They really prefer it. They are the kids who like the second school is out. They are outside moving. But if you have a kid who isn't sort of, you know, naturally prone to that, you do need to set some expectations around that. And for me, what I have found works in my own family and and for so many families I've worked with is you say, these are the priorities. These are the things that need to be done. And then whatever time is left is device time, right? So we need to get chores done. We need to get 30 minutes of physical activity or movement in, you know, we need to do these things. And once those things are done, use the rest of the time for whatever it is that you want to do. And that can include electronics. I think that's a a much better way of going about it, even better than saying things like, you know, uh, you can only have an hour of TV or screen time that ends up turning into a huge thing for parents to have to micromanage and deal with, which doesn't usually go very well. So I focus in on what are our priorities as a family? 
what's, what is the most important to us, especially, um, you know, in the summer months when kids are home, they don't have the structure of school and there's this tendency for them to maybe just roll out of bed and lie on the couch all day with their face in a screen, but to set up some structure for that and say, here's the things that are important. These are the things that need to get done. And then you use the rest of the time for whatever you want, but physical movement absolutely should be a thing on that list especially for kids who are struggling. Mm. You know, whether you have a teenager who is struggling with an anxiety disorder or depression, or you have maybe an eight-year-old who's struggling with um, ADHD or behavioral stuff, they all need movement. Movement, physical activity outperforms um, just about any medication, any other treatment approach that we use. And we really should be prescribing exercise or movement um, for kids. But it's amazing the number of teenagers who come into my clinic, no one has ever asked about what they eat or how they eat or if they eat, which is a big issue for some kids. No one's ever asked them about that. No one's ever asked them about their movement um, habits. Do you get any exercise? No one's ever asked about their sleep. No one's ever asked about any of those things. And they're not getting better even on prescriptions or even with years of counseling. And they look at me like, why are you asking those things? And when I start to educate them about that, they're like, oh, that makes so much sense. And I've had kids as young as like 10 years old say to me, well, why, why didn't my doctor tell me that I should, you know, be running or doing exercise? every day. And it's like, you know, it's a great point. Why aren't we educating? And I think it's because we have this assumption that people won't want to do that, but that's us making a decision for them. And that's not our role as providers to do. Our role is to make sure that parents, kids, adults have all the information about all the options, and then they get to choose. Right. But I would not be doing my job if I didn't educate kids and parents about how robust the evidence is behind physical activity and movement and how to work that in their day, helping them actually implement that because the data is so good that it improves so many things. We should be talking about that. It's almost like a magic bullet. Yeah. How can parents incentivize their children to move more? Because mm-hmm. yeah, at least for me growing up, I was always terrible at sports. Mm-hmm. And so me I was, <laughs> I didn't think of my, yeah, I didn't, th- I didn't think of myself as like an athlete or anything yeah. like that. And so I actually kind of struggled to get, mm-hmm. I think the requisite amount of exercise yeah. on a daily basis. Yeah. I think this goes back to the family system and expectations and modeling. Do they see us as the adults? incorporating physical activity into our day. Now, Mm. that could be something structured like going to the gym, using the Peloton, whatever. Um, It could be, do they see us going out and taking a real long, good walk with the dog? Mm. Do they see us leading an active lifestyle of taking the stairs when that's an option? You know, what do they see us doing? And so when we think about how to incentivize them, that's absolutely the first thing we need to be focused on is our modeling and doing things together. There are kids that I work with who are extremely behaviorally resistive to doing anything that involves physical activity. Hmm. But there are absolutely ways that we slowly but steadily start to get them comfortable with that. And it's short things to start. And it's always with an adult, you know, help me take the dog out just to the end of the driveway to get the mail and back. Great. You know, we're not going to start out with a three mile jog, you know, no, no kid's going to do that, especially if they're resistive to it. So we're going to do it together. We're going to keep it brief and, you know, work them up to that um, and, and look for variety, even in fun activities, right? Doesn't have to be structured exercise on the weekend. Can we, you know, go take a hike? somewhere in the area? Can we go to the beach and play and run around in the sand? Can we pump up the bike tires that have been deflated in the garage all winter? And like, let's just tool around the neighborhood. Let's get the scooters out. Let's go on a scavenger hunt. Doesn't have to be this idea of you need to be doing 45 minutes of, you know, moderate to intense cardiovascular (laughs) exercise. I mean, certainly while that may be ideal, especially when they get into the teen and adult years, you're going to lose them right from the word go. So yeah. how can we just start to incorporate this in ways that feel accessible to them? 
I love that. I so when I was 16, I discovered weightlifting, mm-hmm. and that has that had, that became my go-to yeah. exercise modality. Is uh, resistance training something that you would recommend for for kids? Absolutely, it can be great. Um, two of my, well, actually all three of my boys. Now I have three sons and a daughter and all three of my boys um, have gotten very into um, weightlifting and it's been great for them. But you know where we see that do really good things is not only for the mood and anxiety, but also for kids who struggle with the attention, but but kids who also have diagnoses of what we call sensory processing issues, mm. where their brain's just struggling to take in input from the environment, they're getting overwhelmed. And what a lot of those kids really benefit from is something we call heavy work, which is this proprioceptive input to the muscles and the joints um, that you get from things like carrying a heavy laundry basket or pushing a heavy shopping cart or lifting weights provides that really good proprioceptive input that then has a regulatory effect on the brain. So for parents, if you've got a kid who tends towards the real impulsive, hyperactive, dysregulated side of things, even if they're little and you're not going to be getting them on a weightlifting regimen, you think about that idea of how can we get weight and resistance embedded in activities. Fill to milk jugs with water and let them, you know, carry those around, give them the heavy laundry basket or the box of blocks to push across the floor. That type of resistance and input is so regulating for their brain. That's amazing. I have a few, I feel like children with sensory processing issues, Mm -hmm. that's sort of in my purview because I I think I might have a friend or two that have kids that have that. That's yeah. uh, that's super interesting and very actionable. I love that. Yeah. And there's many more. I mean, you know, when we were talking earlier about just how many more kids have issues. Sensory processing disorder is it's not even an officially recognized diagnosis, but th- we do know that it exists and that many, many more kids struggle with that now. So that's another one we can put in that basket of just, yeah, lots of parents dealing with more and more kids with everything from mild sensory issues like tags on shirts or seams on socks bother them a bit, um, all the way to kids with very, very severe and profound challenges with auditory input, visual input, touch input. Mm. Um, so those are those are things that fall in this entire realm that we're talking about. And that's not even a, a widely accepted diagnosis at this it's point. It's not official. You know, it, it really, in my opinion, it should be based on all the anecdotal evidence and the research that has been done. Um, unfortunately, the last time the the American Psychiatric Association updated their diagnostic Bible. Um, they declined to mm. um, to include it again, um, and that's a whole nother episode on how and why all that happens. But we do know it's a very real thing. Sensory processing is something that we know. I mean, it's it's a an integral part of what our brain is doing every moment of every day. And when you have disruption um, for whatever reason in your brain's ability to take in and make sense of information from the sensory environment, it can create all different challenges. So it is a very real thing and something that many more parents are dealing with today with their kids. Would it just typically get filed under like ASD or something? Well, yeah. I mean, that's these kids, if they end up needing a diagnosis, often will get diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, with ADHD, because both of those have become a catch-all for all kinds of things, Um, sensory processing being one of them. But uh, kids with anxiety, sensory processing tends to, those kinds of challenges tend to overlap with other kinds of symptom presentations. But but it makes sense because if the brain is struggling to form neural connections um, from an early age, of course, it's going to impact lots of areas, right? Including that ability to make sense of environmental input. So to me, it makes sense that we would see those symptoms over with lots of other things. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that, you're going to love this. What we eat has an uh, has an, um, an influence on our ability to be patient, empathetic, altruistic people. It's no wonder, you know, everybody is just at each other's throats all the time. Yeah, this is very real, man. You know, we are wondering, I know a lot of folks listening, like uh, my family member or my friends or people on social media, why aren't they listening? Like we've got this data over here that contradicts this other information why aren't people able to like process take time and like understand another perspective we are max this is real like we every opportunity i get i'm going to keep saying this stuff we are the sickest nation in the history of the world self-inflicted let's be clear self-inflicted 
right now in America, we have over 200 million people who are overweight or obese. That number, we can't even, it doesn't make sense. Like we can't really process that well. We have over 135 million people who are type two diabetic or pre-diabetic. It's, it's, it makes no sense. Right now, over 60% of the population have some degree of heart disease. Right now, 115 million people on average are sleep deprived. What? And on top of that, about 70% of the population is on pharmaceutical drugs. Mm. The system is already doing what it's designed to do, which is to feed into and, and, and basically have the, the farming, the hyper farming of sick people. And we know so many wonderful people who are in this space. I got into this space to help people. But if you take really smart people and you teach them the wrong thing, they become world-class at doing the wrong thing, you know, and, which is treating symptoms and not addressing underlying causes of diseases. And so with that said, heart disease every year is the number one killer. Every year, cancer, number, one, number two killer. The third leading cause of death is iatrogenesis, physician-created illness. Hmm. Johns Hopkins, anybody can look it up. Our system is, it's not that it's broken, it was designed to be this way. And it's unfortunate, but we have to look at this stuff so we can fix it. And like you said, 2020 coming along, because the system before this is so, so like concrete and stable, it's hard to change it. Now when stuff starts to get a little bit fluxed up, hmm. you know, it becomes more malleable. And I'm excited about it, man. Like at first, of course, I was resisting and just like, why is this happening, you know? And now I'm just, I love it. Like I want, I want 20, this is going to sound crazy. I want 2020 to keep going until we get it. <laughs> until like, we get it. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, 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 it's ironic and beautiful. It's poetic, but it's what's needed because things were not working. It wasn't like this is just out of nowhere. These issues are festering underneath the surface all this time. And we're still trying to take the same approach to it. If we can just come up with a drug, we can fix people, Right. How has it worked out for us? And if we just are, take an honest perspective, something is wrong. And a part of that is, of course, like what are we making ourselves out of? We cannot drug ourselves out of making ourselves out of absolute garbage, stuff that humans were never designed to consume. And this is, this is really basic stuff, but here's the thing too, and, you know, and this is where I come in at, is like, we gotta make it attractive. You know, we've gotta make it fun. We've gotta make it approachable. And it's never been more challenging because of our attention is being pulled away so, so frequently. But at the same time, it's never been so much opportunity. Mm. You know, it just depends on how you look at all this stuff. You must, I mean, like me, I feel like you must love nutrition. Like you must love, like I, I wake up every day and I'm just like excited to scan the, you know, the, the press, the university press releases for like new studies and things like that. And you know, I, the, the amount of gratitude, the, the amount of, um, gratification that I get, is that a word gratification? The amount yeah. just the amount of joy that I get when I, when something clicks yeah. in my brain, that yeah. feeling oh, of insight, I know what you're talking it's about. the best feeling ever. <laughs> and that's why, yeah, I'm just so glad that you're doing that, that you're doing what you do. So how do we, how do we then transmute that feeling to everybody else? Cause I feel like yeah. if we could do that, right. Yeah. I think it, and we're already doing it, man. It's contagious. You know, um, <laughs> I had so many of the, when you're saying it, like I had so many of those experiences by myself in my office, writing this book. And I'm just like, oh my God, <laughs> like, and it's so funny. And then I catch myself and I'm just laughing at myself. Like it's such a nerd, you know, but I'm a cool nerd. Um, you know, what's, what's so interesting is that I, I believe that part of it in the, in being able to receive the information and to have that kind of click happen. It's not that it's, it's not that it's impossible when you're not feeling well. Mm. It's just harder. Yeah, you know. And the same thing with having empathy and compassion and uh, patience. It's not that it's impossible. It's just harder. And so what I want to do is stack conditions in people's favor, like get them feeling a little bit better, so they become more receptive to the next thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm very big on practical, like on ramp, small, simple things. Um, and this just kind of gets into what's in the book and, and, and putting it together in this way where folks can just really kind of lean into whatever their goal is. So we have to give people what they want. And right now, arguably our most press, pressing issue and just such a massive uh, susceptibility to all manner of diseases, infectious diseases and chronic diseases is obesity. You know, about 400,000 folks every year 
die with some kind of uh, issue related to obesity and being overweight. And so with that said, it's a major issue, but I think what's been left out of the conversation is really getting the power into people's hands and teaching them how this stuff works. Our system of weight loss has been hyper-focused on calories, mm. right? And so I have this thing in me. I, think, I always think about, like when I hear it, I'm like, where the hell did it come from? There was not like, the, you know, when you see the hieroglyphics on the pyramids, like there's not like a plate of calories. I'm like, you know, this, there's, that didn't, it wasn't a thing. You know, the, 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 the ancient Romans and Greeks had this very physical culture. Like it wasn't a thing. Nobody was looking for it when it was discovered. And actually it had nothing to do with nutrition when it was discovered. It was used in engineering and physics. But when it made its parlay into nutrition, thanks to Wilbur Atwater, but he's kind of a footnote, even though we use the Atwater system, like that's what's on your product labels, which is just doing some math, basically. They're not actually measuring the calories in your food. Hmm. Newsflash. All right. But what really happened was, and why, why it's become permeated in a part of our lexicon so deeply, is thanks to a woman named Dr. Lulu Hunt Peters. Mm. Lulu Hunt Peters. Mm. She's a pioneer. She's famous, but also infamous, mm. all right? And so she wrote a book and it became a massive bestseller, sold over 2 million copies in the early part of the 1900s. That means like seriously, everybody and their daddy had this book. Everybody and their sister had this book or knew about it. And I went back and read these old fangled writings and this, I could not, I could not believe what she was saying. I, could, I just couldn't believe it. Now, there were some big things that are still affecting us today that was put in the culture then. And she initiated the big conversion in thinking about food, which I already discuss, discussed a little bit. It's such a dynamic, multifaceted, powerful thing that's determining what your hormones are doing and what they're made of, what your neurotransmitters are doing, what your liver is doing, how your heart is working. Your food determines everything about you, but we put the, put into this pithy little box. And it was largely due to this work, which was she made the conversion of food being food into looking at food as numbers, mm. all right? It made the shift from food being this multifaceted complex thing to being numbers. She said in her book, you will no longer say one slice of bread. You no longer say I'm eating a slice of bread. You'll say I'm eating 100 calories of, bre of bread. You'll no longer eat or say I'm eating three, uh, 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 a slice of pie. You'll eat 350 calories of pie, all right? So it made that shift to now it's all about numbers. And she asserted that a woman who was her, same her height, her, her same height could eat whatever she wanted as long as she maintained 1200 calorie a day diet, mm. right? And she struggled with her weight her whole life. That's the side note that you don't get with the story. Now that's one part, looking at food in terms of numbers now, instead of all the other things that it does. And, and, and actually the things that control what calories do, which is what we dive into in the book. But the other thing was she began the widespread indoctrination of associating food with morality, All right? So now she was pressing into, into culture like, it's a character defect if you can't maintain your weight, mm -hmm. you know, and relating words like punishment and sin. And so it was just getting you to this place where you relate, it's, it becomes like religiosity, right? And one other little aspect, and this is actually a major aspect and something I really worked to address and fix this issue because I had patients coming in every day saying this stuff, like having this association in their mind, even if it's unconscious. She began the belief that if you're hungry, you're doing it right. If you're hungry, that's when weight loss is happening. And she said that this was down around again, like time of World War I. And she said, and I'm just gonna paraphrase, for every hunger pang you feel, you should have a double joy knowing that you're saving the hunger pangs in someone else because of the food rationing. You're saving the hunger pains in a hungry child, right? So you're showing patriotism for your country <laughs> and you're losing weight at the same time. You should have a double joy, right? And so the, the big problem with she this- She might've had an eating disorder. <laughs> well, you know, there you go. I mean- There you go. But this is where the, the roots come from. You know, and these ideas just permeated the culture. And today we know that it's not just about like you're hungry and weight loss is happening. If you're hungry, these are signals from your body that something is wrong. And we dive into what all those things are and actually what is controlling hunger, you know, and the, the, the hormones involved. A lot of folks, of course, know about like leptin and ghrelin. These are like the captains, but there's, you know, CCK, there's GLP-1, 
And one of the most poetic things about nature and how we're designed is that our leptin, which is the major satiety hormone, is actually produced by the fat cells, you know? And you would think, all right, I've got all of this fat on my body. I should be feeling very satisfied because leptin is a satiety hormone. Why am I not satisfied? And I make the connection and, and the kind of analogy that I, cut, that I weave throughout the book of our hormones because our hormones are controlling so much. It's just like, they're, I, I refer to them as like metabolic DMs, mm. right? So it's like <laughs> sending little text messages or emails or you know pinging your other cells to keep everybody in touch. But if the message keeps, if there's so much, you know what happens if somebody puts you in a group text and all this crazy stuff, or you know, you're getting spammed, it goes to the spam box. You start to have resistance to that data coming in, right? And it gets flagged. That's what happens when we are bombarded and your body fat gets to this place, like the signal that leptin is pro getting produced by your cells, it's still getting produced, but the receptor sites start to shut down. You start to have resistance mm. because of that constant spamming. Right. And so we have to address these underlying issues. Right. We have to address the leptin sensitivity. What are the things we can do when there's so many cool things we could do? But this isn't being taught when the experts are saying, just get in a calorie deficit, get in a calorie deficit. It's, it's so unfortunate. I'm just, again, I'm sick of it. And I'm going to make sure everybody knows what's really controlling what calories are doing. I so appreciate that. Um, so important. Yeah. Cause I feel like, I feel like to dial everything down to calories is really insulting to people who are struggling in the face of the modern food supply that just at every, you know, with every morsel is just compelling you to eat more and to eat more and to eat more. And we now have data, like we have data, that whole thing from Dr. Peters that, that you just um, explained, you know, we, we know that scientifically that the only time you're going to be hungry is when you're trying to consume a calorie deficit and you're basing your diet primarily around ultra processed foods because for the same degree of satiety, whole foods actually, um, they fill you up and you come in at a calorie deficit naturally, right? Whereas ultra processed foods, you get filled up the same degree of satiety and you're actually in a surplus. So you actually shouldn't be hungry. And, um, and so that's a really interesting thing that you bring up about leptin. So the more fat cells you have, you would think that your satiety, you'd be more satiated and that your metabolism would be faster, but you actually develop leptin resistance. Yeah. So yeah, what do we do to, to solve that problem? Well, I, first I wanna address what you just said, the ultra processed foods versus whole foods, mm. because now we have real, real world, tent, because for, of course we've known for years, like the quality of food matters, right? It's just, it should just be obvious, but now we really know. And so one of the studies that I mentioned was highlighted in the, the journal Food and Nutrition Research, and the scientists wanted to find out what actually happens with your caloric expenditure or caloric absorption when you eat a meal of processed foods versus a meal of whole foods. Mm. And so they had the test subjects to consume either a sandwich of whole, what they deemed to be whole foods, which was multi-grain bread and cheddar cheese, <laughs> or a sandwich of processed food, which was white bread and cheese product, which that's craft, <laughs> by the way. They can't legally call it cheese. You know, so can't these scientists be a little more creative? I mean, you know, it's, it's levels to it all, Max, mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. levels to it. But here's what happened. Okay. They're the same amount of calories. The sandwich are the same amount of calories, same amount of proteins, carbohydrates, and fat. Same on paper. Well, the subjects who ate the processed food sandwich had a 50% reduction in calorie burn after eating that sandwich. Wow. Their body, their metabolism changed. Their hormones changed in a way that made them retain and hold on to more of that energy they consumed. It created these hormonal clogs. So again, in the conversation about a calorie deficit, some of these things aren't gonna matter if we're not addressing these things that are controlling what calories are doing in the body, right? And that's just one of them. You know, There's like five major factors uh, that I cover in the book. And then with leptin sensitivity, you know, that shift, in, that one shift in of itself, moving away from the process foods to more what we call whole foods. And of course, there's so many levels to what that looks like. It changes how your body is associating, how your cells are associating with each other, kind of clearing, clearing up that line of communication. So leptin's message is getting heard now by the cells again. And uh, another really important thing that, you know, this is really kind of like the final frontier where we are right now. We've learned so much this in the last couple of years, but we still don't know anything. Like we don't know anything 
which is the gut, you know, what's happening in the gut. Mm. And our gut bacteria are really the first decision makers on whether or not you're going to absorb those calories, what's going to happen with those calories. And this was highlighted in the journal Cell. They found that they, they discovered a certain bacteria in mice prevented, they basically blocked their intestines from absorbing as many calories from their food. And then to see that on the surface, some folks were like, can we get a bottle of that <laughs> bacteria, whatever that is, so I can stop absorbing so many calories? That's what I'm wondering. Just yeah. kidding. <laughs> now, here's the thing. That's not necessarily a good thing, right? But we coupled that with human studies, and this was from the Wiseman Institute. We know, and I knew this in, in, my, in my clinical practice, I can have somebody go get a stool sample and I can get their report. We know today I can look at the bacteria makeup that you have and never see you and know whether you are obese or not based on your bacteria cascade. There is a bacteria cascade associated with obesity and insulin resistance. So this, quote, fat bacteria in human test subjects, they took these fecal samples and put them into lean mice and they took healthy human samples and put them into lean mice. The lean mice who received the, fat, quote, fat bacteria from humans immediately had insulin resistance, gained weight, and increased body fat. Wow. Simply by changing the bacteria cascade. And to put a little like cherry on top for this, a little, like a little bit of, before I go crazy with it, this one blew my mind. Identical twins. They took identical twins. All right. They're identical. But they'll tell you, of course, like I'm not the same as mine. You know? <laughs> of course. But identical twins. So everything should be the same about them, right? And they found that when one twin had the bacteria cascade associated with obesity and insulin resistance versus a healthy kind of what's deemed to be healthy cascade in identical twins eating the same exact diet, the twin with the, quote, fat bacteria more prevalent gained weight while the other one did not, eating the exact same diet. So again, when we're talking about getting into a calorie deficit and managing what's happening with the, our calorie intake, our microbes have a major, major role in this stuff. And also our microbes are associating with cells that are responsible for the metabol uh, metabolizing our hunger-related hormones. And some of our, uh, I'm sorry, and satiety-related hormones, some of our satiety-related hormones like GLP-1, some of these are actually produced in the gut. Hmm. Right, so getting our appetite in control has a lot to do with that microbiome, and yeah, so that's so freaking cool, Sean. And it's also like, I mean, it's a it's a really important piece of the puzzle because I think, you know, the 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 the, the, the association between like different microbial signatures with like the you know the phenotype, like the the big question mark there is like, is this is this microbiome composition like the consequence of reflective of or the cause of right. you know what we see in the person but like in that study that you cited what, what's so interesting is that they actually like took the microbiome out of an obese person and they put it into the mouse and they saw the, the mouse phenotype change yeah. so that's fascinating Oof. so let's go into like the the prescription because yeah. i know you're all about that you know like making things actionable and 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 achievable for your audience um so how do we then like support microbiome health what are the kinds of foods that you recommend we steer towards what are the kinds of foods that you recommend that we steer away from like what's your what's your you know how is your and and also how has your dietary philosophy evolved you know over the course of writing this book yeah oh man such a good question you know um again i think the heart of all of it is understanding that you have a unique metabolism and we have to be open you know like for me even going into this book i knew that there was a lot of infighting in our community about minutia and not really focusing on what are the main principles that make any of these diet frameworks successful. And so many people develop this, it's like religiosity around their diet when it's successful for them, but over maybe they do it for two years even, it's working, but then all of a sudden it's not working as well. And we blame the diet, no, I'm sorry, we don't blame the diet, we blame ourselves. Mm. It's just like, I need to paleo harder, I just need to keto harder, I need to vegan harder, right? I'm not vegan, I'm not veganing enough. You know, I really need to clean up my, my act. And of course, there are pieces of that that can be true, but sometimes our diet frameworks don't allow for the thing that you need right now, you know? And we have to, my mission is for us to just open up a little bit and allow ourselves, give ourselves permission to have the thing that your genes, your genes, your microbiome might be calling for to help to heal you. And so with that said, uh, this is really rooted in, we're talking about that microbiome cascade. I did so much experimentation myself. Like I couldn't really speak from a place of efficacy if, I didn't do this stuff myself. So I'll do the diet, but I'll do it for 
a year, two years, three years. Raw food, okay, I'll do it for a year. Keto, okay, I'll do it for a year. Paleo, I'll, I'll do it for two years, you know. <laughs> a vegan, I'll give me three. You know, like I literally, I've done this stuff. She's three years on a vegan diet. <laughs> it's five. <laughs> but here's the thing. Each of these changes in your nutrient intake changes your microbes. That is the number one thing when we're talking about helping to heal this issue is knowing that number one, the diversity of your microbes is directly associated with the, the higher your diversity, the lower your rate of obesity, the lower your rate of diabetes, the lower your, 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 your uh, correlated body weight. It's directly linked. And so in looking at hunter-gatherer tribes and just folks eating more of an indigenous diet, they found that on average, they have four times, upwards of like 10 times more diversity in their microbes than the average Western world person, you know, that eating our typical diet, you know, yeah. standard American diet. Four times more, just say you have, I don't know, a thousand different, species. They got 4,000. Jeez. And so the question is what happened? And what it is, is just like we, some people refer to the microbiome as like a rainforest. Like we have endangered species. You know, we have many that have gone extinct. And some of the data is, and I don't like this because I don't like to speak in extremes, but some of the data is like, you can't get them back once they're gone. You know, and I, I don't completely believe that. It's really about providing the, the food source for the microbes to get a chance to come back. It's just like anything in nature, like you have to have the, the food that you want to just stick around. And so when you pull out a whole food group that maybe your genes really, but maybe you, was, maybe you had an issue with the digestion of it because of the way it was prepared. So you pull the beans out, for example. Not, this is not an advocation for beans, okay? Just calm down. <laughs> but maybe for your, your genes and maybe for your ancestry, maybe this was like a staple, you know, maybe it was dal, you know, like mung beans or whatever. Dengu, if you're Kenya, you know, mm. and maybe you've been eating it for centuries. Um, but now you're here in the States and you're not making it the same way your grandmother used to or whatever. And now like you have some digestive issues or maybe like skin issues and then you do an elimination diet and you remove this and the microbes go too because they were eating that food. That was their, their pre, the prebiotic, right? These terms, but we really got to get this. It's not just like a supplement you take. This is the food for your microbes. And so that's at the heart of it. Number one is being more focused and in, in on diversity because the number one, and I shared a really great study in, in Eat Smarter of increasing your diversity of foods increases your diversity of microbes, hmm. which is just so obvious, but I, we have data on it now. So even if we're eating healthy, you know, quote, quote healthy, we still can get into the meal prep gone awry, you know, where it's just like, you know, you're doing the same stuff just on rotation and we need more diversity. You know, so um, some of the common prebiotic foods is like, you know, asparagus, Jerusalem artichoke, uh, onions and garlic. You know, we hear these things, but some of the most fascinating, I think so much science is going to come out in the upcoming years is resistant starch, hmm. you know, and I was resistant to resistant starch. You were resistant to resistant starch? Yeah. Sean yeah. Stevenson? We could put that. That's a tweetable. <laughs> That's a tweetable. And I was having, this was you know, back, this was many years ago, but I was experiencing dysbiosis because of all the experimentation I was doing. And I was eating what I believed to be the right thing. And, but over time, like I start to have more food sensitivities. And so I would just like, oh, let's just eliminate that. Then I got into my like safe foods list. And I, then I started to get nervous if I eat a different food, which then I knew like, oh, something's wrong. Like I got to stop this. And you know, a friend of mine, a physician friend of mine was like, well, maybe you should try adding in, you know, this particular, which I didn't know at the time was a resistant starch. And I was like, uh, I don't know about that. Brown rice? No. Nah. <laughs> you know, I know it's got the, you know, it's the, the, the anti-nutrients in there, you know, gut irritants, but- Arsenic too in brown rice. There you go. But it's got, when I was in school, in my traditional, like my nutritional science class in my university- Every, and this was like, you know, this is back in the day, you know, kind of I've been <laughs> in the game for a while, but we were taught basically everything brown, you should be down, right? You should be down with it like brandy. You know, everything that's brown is good. The white <laughs> is not good, right? So white, white rice out, uh, white potatoes out, right? But the thing was that even then I still had the inside. I was like, 
why when I go to, you know, my favorite Chinese food restaurant, like I see the owners there eating white rice and vegetables, whatever. They're definitely not eating the hot braised chicken that I'm, <laughs> that I'm eating, you know? But I'm just like, did they not get the memo that brown is better? What's wrong? Centuries, guys? Come on, guys. <laughs> and what it was is just centuries ago, they figured out like there's a gut irritant here and we could just, you know, strip that away. And this is not saying that white rice is some glorious nutri nutritive source, but it's just like making it safer for the average person. Okay, now that's, that's just a part of it. It's a slice of it. Not to say that brown rice can't be helpful or, or healthy for some folks, but what can we do to help to reduce you know, the phytates, reduce the anti-nutrients? Soak it and use a pressure cooker, right? And so I started to do that. I would actually get sprouted rice, brown rice, and I start to add it in. I started feeling better. And I'm like, oh shit, like my belief system is starting to crumble because I was like, I'm not, I'm not eating that stuff. <laughs> Um, you know, same thing, there's beans, but any, the, also something really cool that's coming forward, forward in this work is that the colors of food are dramatically associated with the nutrition that's in the food, mm. right? So this category of like white, beige, like brown stuff is high in resistant starch, potentially. And so here's what's the interest the, with resistant starch. So white rice, if it's cooked and then cooled, the resistant starch content shoots up. Wow. All right. And then if it's cooled and then reheated, it goes up even higher. Wow. So your microbes like that are associated, you know, we got bacteriodetes and firmicutes. The bacteriodetes, well, firmicutes, if you want, this was the saying, I didn't make this up. If you want to be firm and cute, you got to reduce the firmicutes. You got to reduce right? the firmicutes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the bacteriodetes love, though it's associated with leanness, love resistant starch. Mm. Love it. And so white rice can actually be helpful, which is, again, that's very counter counterculture, but everything has, it's nuanced. This doesn't mean to start going ham on white rice, but I just want to make sure the data is available because rice is a big staple in many people's diets. How do you do it? And so I do like a little sidebar. It's called Rice, Rice Baby in the, in the book, you know, and- um, I like it, 90s hip hop <laughs> throwback pun. Uh, one of the other ones, just a super common, is a banana. Okay. This, what a controversial food this is, you know. But for, you know, just growing up here in the States, like bananas like that handy dandy, you know, go to. <laughs> but as we know, it's been genetically manipulated for a long time now to eliminate the seeds, you know, like, and I put a picture of a wild banana in the book. They're like almonds, like, they're like <laughs> huge seeds. It was like, Really, it took a lot of energy and work to get anything from the banana. Like you had to work around it. And if you're eating the seeds, you're also getting fats along with it too. But they've been bred to be more sweet and get rid of those seeds. I remember even when I was a kid, there was still like these little bitty teeny seeds. They're gone now. Hmm. Bananas, even if they're organic, they cannot reproduce in nature on their own anymore. They need human intervention. We've made them impotent. Wow. We've made a banana. The, the irony too, <laughs> given the bananas, you know, the, the association that bananas have with Anyway, I, that's right. It was an awkward day in eighth grade <laughs> yeah. uh, health class for me, man. The banana came out, you know, <laughs> not mine. Never mind. Yes. There's a teacher is a demonstration, just to be clear, just to be clear. <laughs> but as the banana, you know, the green banana is high in starch, specifically this resistant starch. But as it gets more yellow, it starts to like that it transitions from starch into sugar. And so but now nobody likes a green banana, you know. Well, I'm sorry. There's probably somebody that's like, I do. But maybe if you take a little bit of a green banana and like throw it into a smoothie, you get some of that resistant starch. There's green banana, green banana flour is getting pretty popular right now. They've never even seen that. That's awesome. Yeah. So like making little baked goods, just kind of, you know, uh, sliding that in there. But even if the banana is like ripe, like the yellow banana, but now it's like pretty, pretty high in sugar. But this still doesn't mean that it's bad. Like you could still, everything has its place. Of course. You know, and if it's in combination with some other things as well. Um, but there's still that one little, the little tip of the banana, that little brown tip, even when it's, it's called the devil's anus, you know, it's that little nasty part of the banana. The, at the, the, at the front of the banana? It's at the bottom. At the, the that's right. It's, it's the, the devil's it, anus. The devil's anus. Yeah. Never going to look at bananas the same again. That's right. Every yeah. banana has a, has an anus. <laughs> is that what, is that what we're learning here? I'm thinking, was it, was it Thor Ragnarok? Like hmm. they went into that hole. I think it was like. 
I think, I think well, that might have been called the devil. The Saints cosmic game. anus. Yeah, something like that. Interesting. Shout out to Thor. I mean, we all have them. No shame, you know. <laughs> um, so, so bananas, man. If you, you know, what's interesting is like you're so right that they they've been cultivated right to contain more starch and sugar than ever before in human history. But still, people are like, it's whole fruit. You know, there's nothing wrong with eating whole fruit, and I. I agree with that. Like eat whole fruit. But if you, if you just kind of like extrapolate out, what if we bred the banana to be even bigger and mm -hmm. bigger and big? like at what point would, would it be reasonable to suggest maybe not eating them all the time? You know what I'm saying? Like I go sometimes depending on like, you know, the season and I see apples at like my local um, supermarket. Yeah. And sometimes you'll find apples that are bigger than your head. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. You know? It's crazy when they and the 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 true origins of many of these foods. It'll fascinate you, you know, when you find out the size of an apple is tiny, and also even lettuce. You know, lettuce was it was a narcotic. You know, it's basically had psychoactive properties, and they've been bred over time so that the lettuce, of course, those it was alkaloids. You know, they bred it to be you know just safe little unsuspecting whatever. Back in the day, if you ate a salad. I mean, you'd be hired than, you know, Snoop Dogg doing that Mike Tyson fight. You know, it's just like, what? Yeah. But that that's one really cool aspect. But something else, too, in this in this domain, I actually uh, put a study and I actually put a graph into the book looking at folks. Because, again, you make the assumption the banana is clearly going to be better for you than a cookie. Mm. It of depends course. on the person. All right. Because the banana, again, is coming with some micronutrients and you know it's it's a real whole food and not to say for me it just it already supersedes it however if just looking at the impact on the blood sugar of these folks um, some folks would eat a banana and they would get a crazy blood sugar spike and then the preceding crash like they go hypoglycemic and they eat a cookie it's as if they ate nothing mm. just the blood sugar just stays st stayed so stable versus other folks, you know, they have what you would think, which is like they eat the cookie and they have the spike and crash and the banana is just kind of like a little bit of a spike. So, and what the researchers uh, were leaning into is that a big player in this is most likely what's their microbiome and how their microbiome is associating with the different foods. So one food for somebody could be detrimental versus somebody else. And this is stuff that we know, we talk about it, but now we've got some data. And I wanna make sure everybody knows. That's so interesting. I love what you were saying about rice being cooked and cooled. You know what? I uh, I, I eat sushi a lot and um, I feel very comfortable eating uh, sushi rice because it's basically that. It's yeah. been cooked and cooled, right? It's just like sitting there cooling off. Plus they add vinegar to sushi rice and vinegar mm -hmm. we know has an anti-hyperglycemic effect Yeah, as well. What's your stance on, um, uh, we've talked about plants and resistant starch, which I love, super important, surfacing that for, for listeners. Uh, What's your stance on like omnivory? Like, are you pro anti meat? Like, what have you, or chicken, fish? Like, what's your stance there? Yeah. Um, again, for me, this is a unifier. Eat smarter is a unifier. Whatever diet framework anybody subscribes to, they'll know the things that make it effective across the board and also the things on any diet framework that can really mess you up. And I call them like the three amigos of, of fat storage. Mm. And what it really boils down to, and this is for me, I, I always like to just lean onto the side of, of rationality and lean onto the side of what have we done the longest as humans? And what do our genes expect of us? So it's a bigger conversation. It isn't just like this new trendy thing. Like what have we done as humans? And so we evolved eating plants and animals. You know, that's what we have to really just come to face, face to face with that. And, you know, folks will be like, well, there's this culture over here, you know, they... They made they mostly plants. They still had some animal products. And this is, again, we're talking about millions of years of evolution, even just in recent history, history, centuries and centuries, most recent. It's only been in the last few decades that we've completely, some folks make the decision to completely pull out animal foods. And I understand. I do understand. And, I'm, and also, I know that you can be successful on a, a, in a, on a plant-based diet, but you have to be clever because there are certain things you absolutely need that most folks, and the body is so resilient and also very good at storing things. So it might be great for you like the first year, like you get a first year vegan, <laughs> oh, you can't tell them nothing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but then, you know, see me five years from now. And always, of course, and then there's like the anomaly, you know, it's been vegan, you know, for 20 years or whatever. 
Um, but one of the biggest issues that I want to make sure today, moving forward for all of us, but in particular, I want to give a little sidebar for folks who are taking a vegan and vegetarian approach, how freaking important DHA is and EPA. Like I want everybody to get this. This is this might be like top five things that we need to survive and to not just survive, to thrive as humans. And so number one, um, in looking at what's happening with the brain, our brain is the most ravenous organ. Like it's only about 2% of our body weight, but it's absorbing and consuming about 25% of our calories. Like it is hungry. And your brain, and this really, this study freaked me out, but this is one of those moments I was by myself and I get to talk about it, Max, I'm glad. <laughs> I could not believe this. Your brain will gladly absorb if you just, let me, let me relax. <laughs> it will gladly consume about 50% of the glucose in your bloodstream, mm. all right? So it's not a joke. Because we have these sugar gates, you know, the blood-brain barrier, just express pathway, pathway for sugar. And so when you're drinking a soda or you're eating, you know, these cra this crazy amount of sugar, the stuff that I just grew up doing every day, a tremendous amount of that is fucking up your brain, like immediately and creating insulin resistance in your brain. You have receptors in your brain, these, these, the pathways into the, oh, let's start there, let's start there. The brain being that it's the, the most complex organ in the known universe, right? It's just so powerful, but it's also, it's ironic because it's also the most delicate, mm. right? And, but it's also, nature doesn't come to the party without some equipment. It's got, you have your cranium to protect you. It's the only organ that's fully encased in bone to protect you from external intru intrusions. And but internal intrusions as well can kill you. So we developed the blood-brain barrier. Now here's the thing, and we know this has been something we've talked about for many years, how fat, how important fat is for the brain. Now this, there's nuance here because your brain only allows in very particular nutrients. It is very selective in what can cross over the blood-brain barrier and feed your brain. And you know, saturated fat has been vilified and vindicated and vilified and vindicated. From real whole foods, pretty good for you. But as far as feeding the brain, because a nice portion of the brain is fat, saturated fat. Here's the thing. When you're a baby, the, 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 the gates, the blood-brain barrier allowing saturated fat in, it's, it's like sopping it up like mm. a biscuit, all right? Even mother's milk can be upwards of 50% saturated fat. Wow. For a reason. It's for the development of the brain in early childhood. However, as an adult, it's all but not allowing saturated fat in. Your brain will make it itself. Wow. <laughs> the brain is so cool. <laughs> so now with DHA and EPA, now this is where it gets really important. The, the fats in the brain are not like the other fats in your body. All right. We have storage fats. When people are talking about like burning fat, these, the white adipose tissue we have, these are storage fats. So visceral fat, subcutaneous fat, intramuscular fat, these are storage fats. The fat in your, it, it was an evolutionary advantage to make sure that your brain is not storage fat so that in times of famine, your brain isn't eating itself. Right. All right? Now, the fats in your brain, these are structural fats, all right? And so allowing that to cross the blood-brain barrier Omega-3s, specifically DHA and EPA, these are really the core of the structural fats to make your brain cells. The, the structure of the cell, the uh, signal transduction, the ability for them to talk, this, you have to have these structural fats. And so what the data found was that they took MRIs and actually found that the folks consuming the least, like three, under three grams of DHA, had massive amounts of brain shrinkage. Mm. And this isn't th like the shrinkage because it's cold outside. <laughs> This is like permanent mess you up. Yeah. And so here's the thing. And this was the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. They found that when folks simply added in more DHA and EPA into their diet, they had measurable, and this was versus a placebo, measurable improvements in their memory and their reaction time just by adding in more D. Like these are things, it's, like, it's not just about prevention. This can make your brain work better quickly. And so the target here is just a little bit over a teaspoon of DHA and EPA. And then of course, for me, I'm always like food first. And this is getting into the conversation about what spectrum are you at with your dietary choices from vegan to carnivore. 
Uh, we know, and this is based on the data, this is based on the data that fish is the best source that you're gonna find. And specific, specifically fatty fish, so you know, salmon, uh, mackerel, sardines, but also their eggs. So fish eggs, so caviar, salmon roe, there's like 10 times more in salmon roe than you'll find in the salmon. Which is again, like if you're freaked out by that, you don't have to have it, there's other sources. But then folks will have this, and this is something that I believe, you know, when I was doing the vegan approach, I was like, I'm cool. Like I'll get my omega threes from my plants. It's ALA, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. And ALA has value and I go through and talk about that in the book, but your bo- it's, DHA is so important, your body will convert some of the ALA into DHA and EPA but you lose like at least 75% in the process, in the conversion process. So for you to get the amount of DHA and EPA that you actually need to have a healthy brain, you're gonna have to like beer bong chia seeds all day. <laughs> like you're just gonna have to constantly have that rolling in and you might as well set up shop in your bathroom and just sit there all, all day. Also it depends, like there's, there's variation in terms of the way different, like gender differences, right? Like men, I believe are not, like effective at all. I mean, I, I, men can can basically, you know, like just beer bong ALA essentially and not enrich the brain with DHA at all as a result. Women, I think they, um, if I recall correctly, they have like a little bit more leeway and certain different ethnic backgrounds, you know, yeah, like- Yeah, all that matters. Yeah. And of course the microbiome, like what is your gut gonna do in this whole process? And part of what you just said, man, I love talking to you. Part of that is an evolutionary advantage to feed a baby. And babies, they're going to they're going to siphon from the mother all the DHA and EPA that the baby can get. It's critical for the development of the of the child. And so this is something that mothers really, even in pre-pregnancy, if at all possible, really make sure that our DHA and EPA levels are up. But that's one of those things, like you said, depending on our gender. And that's not accounted for in a calorie label, you know, on a food label. None right. of this stuff, you yeah. know, the gender differences. So that's one part. Now, with the structural fat. So what do, what do we do if we're doing a plant-based approach? And you, these are critical. And I hope and I'm making this very clear today how critical this is. And now we could talk about other areas of it, though, too. Uh, too. But, okay, so we have to look at where do you lie on your ethics? Because in the data, so fish... First, and by the way, with fish, and I want to see like, does this actually show up on, you know, actually eating the fish, does this show up in improvements? And so uh, Rush University researchers uh, did a study and they found that folks eating just one seafood meal per week perform better on cognitive skills tests than folks eating less than one seafood meal per week. Mm. It's right, we've got the data. But what has the most clinical evidence is fish oil. So many studies, like folks just taking a fish oil supplement and having improvements in declarative memory, uh, explicit memory, reaction time, attention span, all this stuff, placebo controlled studies, it's crazy. All right, krill oil. We don't have as much data, but krill is pretty cool. I mean, you know, it's got the astaxanthin and all that good stuff, but it's a microscopic shrimp that might be, you know, like you don't want to kill baby shrimp, you know, a super, 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 super duper baby. Shrimp, you know, there's there's microscopic shrimp, but I would heavily recommend somebody doing a plant-based approach to look to krill oil, or then the next step is algae oil, which we don't have very much data on as far as like double-blind placebo-controlled studies, anything like that. But the DHA is there, it's there, and humans have consumed algae for many years as well. It's been a staple of some uh, civilizations, but they also ate animal foods too, you know, like cultures in Chad and, and Mesoamerica, you know, like the Aztecs, they ate spirulina, but they also ate animal foods. So we have to, I, I just want to implore everybody to make sure that they're getting the DHA and EPA they need and whatever method that is, a whole food approach, of course, this would be something to look to with a whole food based supplement, like a fish oil, krill oil, algae oil as another option. I love that. So, I mean, if listeners take two things away from this conversation to increase their consumption of whole food resistant starch and boost their intake of DHA, you know, and the foods that contain DHA. And I'm sure you list them in your book. 
Um, you know, you already mentioned, you know, the different, the different fish types, but DHA is not exclusive to fish. I mean, you find DHA in right egg grass fed beef, grass fed beef. Yeah. Um, I feel like people, people should expect to see a noticeable improvement, yeah. um, in their health. That's amazing. I mean, I feel like we can, there, there are so many different topics that we could cover. I mean, I'm just looking at your book. It's like, it's a, that, that's a thick, thick with two C's. That's a thick book. <laughs> it's thicky, thicky, thicky. Thicky, thick. Yeah. Yeah. People should definitely check it out. It's yeah. called Eat Smarter. Use the power of food to reboot your metabolism, upgrade your brain, and transform your life. Damn. I got goosebumps just uh, just reciting the subtitle. It's so so beautiful, man. That's what people need. Yeah. I'm so happy that you, uh, that you wrote it. We're almost out of time. But uh, before I ask you the last question that everybody gets asked on this show, where can listeners connect with you on social media? Perfect. I'm at Sean Model, S-H-A-W-N on IG. And I just really starting to pop, get popping on there and be on there and like hang out before. I mean, I just throw stuff up there, different ideas, but um, it's definitely a place I hang out a little bit more now. Um, Facebook, I'm at the Model Health Show and I pop into Twitter and throw out some random ideas as well <laughs> sometimes. Twitter's just fun. Um, I'm at Sean Model there as well. I like your, uh, I like your social media presence. You don't dabble so much in controversy in terms of like the nutritional factions you're very moderate which i which i very much appreciate i try to be that way too but i can't help myself sometimes yeah i uh, feel you man yeah. i mean there's definitely again 2020 is just bringing out there's so much um polarity you know folks are becoming more extreme and this is this is you know it just goes back to so many traditions like having that balance you know and um I, again i'm grateful that this is happening because we can see how quickly we can jump to the other side of things. And now I, I really want to say this, and this is so important to me for us to, to realize how little we know, you know, like we are just scratching the surface on many of these things, but we act like we've got everything figured out. And we're in this process of, of discovery. And once you think you figured it out, you're lost. And right now we have a lot of folks in positions of, of authority who are acting like they know what they're talking about and they know nothing. They know nothing. And once we can get to that place of just being a student and having a curiosity and a desire to learn and to keep growing, it's like it becomes fun. And we can start to invite more people into that versus us acting like we know it all and got it all figured out. Like this, even this component with DHA and EPA, like this is super new. You know, this is, again, like I believe the ALA, like I had it covered. But now we have evidence and as we learn new things, there's still, then you find out that, well, there's actually 10,000 other things that I don't know about this thing, you know? And so I just wanted to share that, that um, for all of us to kind of cultivate a spirit of like a childlike desire to learn, to grow and to have fun and be weary when you come up against a presence that it's like, this is the definitive answer because I promise it's not true. In some instance, there's a way that it is not true, even the things that are most absolute. And that's what science is. It's a constant elimination and evolution past our old belief of science. You know, where we are right now, we're epigenetics, quantum physics, and this made everything before it irrelevant, you know, but we, our science, our systems right now have not caught up to where we are with epigenetics and quantum physics. You know, we're still in like Newtonian science. Mm with so many things that we are taught in medical school, you know? So uh, I just wanted to share that and to, to go on an adventure and um, just to learn more about you and also to know that the person across from you is probably gonna be different, you know? Whatever they need, is, their needs are probably gonna be different and that's okay. And we can all still have fun together and, and, and conversate and talk about ideas, but the most important thing I want to keep directing people back to is to listen to their own body and listen to their own heart. That's beautiful, man. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the, la the last question that usually gets asked to people on this show is what does it mean to you to live a genius life? But I feel like you, you basically, I mean, kind of answered it, but if, you know, there's anything <laughs> that you'd like to add, I mean, that you really summed up what I think is, um, you know, somebody who is, who really is living a genius life, somebody who has that constant beginner's mind, who approaches topics from a standpoint of, I don't know anything and I just want to learn, you know, like open, openness and curiosity. Yeah. Um, would you say that that's, that's living a genius life in your view? Man, that was like, 
some uh, Nostradamus stuff I, I did, I guess. <laughs> I would add one more piece to it. And this is for the folks that, when we talk about a genius life, but this is, the, this is the tough one, but it's also the most beautiful, which is not just being curious, but actually looking for and being open to being wrong, like mm -hmm. actually working that muscle. Thankfully, my wife has <laughs> taught me over the years how easy I could be wrong. Even when I'm right, I'm still wrong, you know? So I'm, when I'm going into the data, I am, I am aware that I have cognitive biases. We all do. We, have, we all have beliefs about what we think reality is. And it's, it, it, it creates our, our a level of certainty in the world. Without that belief about how life is, things start to crumble around you. Like when things become, and this is a big issue right now with people just like, why doesn't somebody accept this, this truth? Like the data is right here. Why doesn't somebody accept it? It's because they're going to have to change their belief about reality. Like they believe that this thing is looking out for them or this system or this person. And so being aware that I have these cognitive biases, I've worked over the years to proactively go into the data and look at like, how am I wrong? How is, how is my belief or how is this data even making me believe something that's not true? How can this be inaccurate? And I think it just brings, people pick it up for me, you know, just in my communication. It brings more of a kind of a evolved uh, uh, assessment of things, you know? And if we can work that, that muscle of a willingness to be wrong and also a willingness to listen to somebody else right now, especially more than ever, and have a conversation and to develop more, more empathy and patience and start to ask like, you know, why somebody feels the way that they do instead of just automatically judging them. Like we've got everything figured out. It's another thing we're hyper active at doing is judging other people. And, you know, for me, these are all these factors that go into uh, living a genius life. And I, I, th I thank you so much for the question and for being who you are and encouraging conversations like this. I know there's a thread of us just being connected in, in this thinking. And, you know, I, there's one little other small tiny thing in this that I don't want to overlook. And, you know, for me right now, we're, we're in a tough spot as humanity. You know, it's a very complex situation. And, um, you know, coming from where I come from on paper, again, just like that sandwich, <laughs> I look like, you know, I, I probably shouldn't be here, you know, and I got here where I'm at today because of exposure and just being exposed to ideas and to people. And you never know who you can help, you know, like there are many times when somebody might have felt like a time, you know, of energy might've been wasted, you know, trying to get me out of whatever perspective that I was in, but everything, like we're a patchwork quilt of everybody that we're around, you know? So uh, provide exposure to other people, you know? Share your voice, just know that you're planting seeds. Even if it doesn't seem like it lands on some fertile soil, it eventually will, you know? This is a time for us to really s just speak up and share our voice, share our perspective, have courage, you know, talk about things, be open still, you know, being open to being wrong. And I think we can all develop a more mature cognitive bias Right. For, so for me, my cognitive bias, I'll just share it right here today since I'm with Max. My cognitive bias is that whenever something happens that goes, for me, from my perspective, against natural human functioning, I, a red flag goes up. So whenever I hear something of like, oh, so we need to get this amount of sunlight. Now you're telling us not to. Red flag goes up. Mm -hmm. Not to say that that thing is wrong but a red flag goes up. And so it makes me want to investigate it, but I'm aware that it's there. Uh, right now we've seen this radical increase in, and I, I shared the data back in like June, processed foods. There was companies that were going out of business, like big corporate processed food companies. They're rolling in it. They're Scrooge McDuck in it now. Mm. You know, like this was, this was gold for them, right? So when that happens, red flag goes up for me. Wait, we're shutting things down. People are consuming far more processed foods. What is it going to do to us? Ah, make us more susceptible to everything. Yes. You know, so my, I, I think that we can develop more mature cognitive biases. And I know I just like took the genius <laughs> question, but this for me is, is really where we need to get to is to be open, to be aware of our cognitive biases, be willing to be wrong and be willing to be patient, talk with other people, have courage to stand up 
These are some of the most powerful qualities that you can not just develop, but allow yourself to have right now. We got to stop suppressing our genius, really allow it to, to flower right now because the world really needs it. I love that. And I love, I love where you went with that. I don't really have a very strong authority bias. Um, and so I, I totally relate to what you're saying about, you know, just, just remaining skeptical, you know, like be safe, you know, like use your just rational thought, you know, like, um, do what's safe. Don't take big risks, you know, when it, when your health is involved, um, but just generally speaking, like, don't be afraid to question things, even if they come from people who are your, you know, elected officials yeah. or, or whatever. I mean, I'll just g give you an example. Um, you know, in LA right now, you know, while we tape this, you can't eat in any restaurants for a while you couldn't eat in restaurants, but then they opened up like outdoor seating and you could sit outside in a restaurant and enjoy your food, which was nice. It was not the most pleasant, you know, it's, it's getting cold in LA, especially on the West side, but it was nice to be able to sit outside in a restaurant. It's very part of being human, you know, and to enjoy the fruits of the labor of the human spirit to eat in a restaurant, you know, and they closed down restaurants because they, because, you know, like COVID is spiking in LA, yeah. um, not even allowing restaurants the ability to do that. A judge just determined that that, that, that mandate was done completely arbitrarily with no scientific rationale you know, and that they're going to reverse that order because it's to the detriment of the thousands and thousands of small businesses here in LA. Meanwhile, as you mentioned, mega corporations, junk food Man. producers are oh. rolling in it right now. Man. So something has flipped and I'm not saying who's right or who's wrong or anything like that, but we just need to be skeptical yeah. because, you know, some of the people that we put, the, put our, you know, the most trust in, they don't have it figured out. Yeah. And that's clear. Yeah. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. This is what you have. It's uncurable. You'll have it for life, but just take this. And that was kind of it. They never actually even told me about autoimmunity. They didn't mention those, like that it was an autoimmune disease. They just, you know, kind of sent me out and we asked why and, you know, how, and that was just kind of like, well, we don't really know, you know, and that was pretty much all the answers we got. So I had to, I had to take it into my own hands.